Many Christians seem comfortable with the idea that animals were dying before Adam sinned. But what kind of death would that have been? Today on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Now our topic this week is death before sin. What type of death would that have been? Would that have included animal death or just people? Uh, did animals die gently and peacefully or was disease and violence responsible for death? That's our topic this week. Hey, does, um, does Fluffy drag his back legs around the house now because he's crippled with arthritis and covered with fleas? Relax. Yeah. Did Fifi get cancer and you had to put her down? Did Rover get run over? Hallelujah. It's all part of God's very good creation. Uh, <laughs> how, how, how many Christians could say amen to, to those kinds of ridiculous statements? Uh, surprisingly, seemingly more than you'd think. Exactly. Biblical creationists have long argued verses like Romans 5.12 and 1 Corinthians 15.21 and 22 make it abundantly clear that one man, Adam, brought sin and death into the creation at the time of the fall. Right. If, if the rocks containing fossils, which are dead things, um, that are buried, uh, found all over the world, are really millions of years old, then there was clearly death before Adam sinned, right. and the Bible is wrong. It follows then that the billions of years interpretation of Earth's history is wrong, <laughs> and there was no death before the fall. That's been the biblical creationist argument. Right, and theistic evolutionists attempt to dismiss the problem by simply assigning Genesis to the mythological trash heap <laughs> and, uh, and not even trying to synchronize scripture with science. Right. They, they, they deny, they're, they're denying a, um, Adam and Eve were real people, and some even, even uh, heretically say that Jesus was wrong about history when he talked about Genesis. Because Jesus understood that Genesis was an actual account of historical events. Mm -hmm. uh, now more biblically minded individuals have attempted various ways to try to harmonize Genesis with uh, deep time. And almost every, uh, every one of them uh, try arguing that these Bible verses are simply talking about the death of humans, not animals before the fall. That's where they're going. Right, and, and granted, Romans 5.12 and 1 first, first Corinthians 15.21-22 um, uh, are certainly speaking of, of human death. Right, yeah. But there are several uh, scriptural verses that counteract the idea that uh, animals died pre-fall. Number one would be uh, Genesis 1.29 and 30, where um, pre-fall, God commands all of his creatures, people and vertebrate animals, to eat plants. He actually ends the verse with, and it was so. That would be, I mean, there would be no carnivorous uh, activity pre-fall. Right. And in, in further yeah. support, Isaiah uh, 11, 6 to 9, 65, 17 to 25, speak of a future restoration uh, of, of peace and, and harmony between creatures as it, it was in the beginning before the fall. You know, the, the wolf um, will dwell with the lamb. Yes. Um, we read, yeah. you know, verses like this, and they will not hurt or destroy, and they shall do no evil or harm. Right. Um, yeah. What do these mean? A summary of the meaning of Isaiah 11, 6 to 9 is given by British theologian Nigel Cameron. He wrote, essentially, it has two thrusts of teaching. It implies that there is, in fact, something fundamentally awry with the animal kingdom, that predation and animosity which characterize it are not as they should be, and secondly, it asserts that it is man's religious condition that is responsible for the state of things, the absence from the earth of the knowledge of the Lord, human sin, and evil in nature are interconnected and in relation of cause and effect. So. Right. Indeed, I, Isaiah was alluding to the conditions in Eden uh, before the fall. Um, Irish biblical scholar Alec Mottier a former principal of Trinity College in uh, Bristol, explains, quote, There is an Edenic element in Isaiah's thinking. There is also a change in the very order of things itself. Herbivorial nature of all the creatures points to Eden restored, Genesis 1, 29 and 30. The enmity between the woman's seed and the serpent is gone, Genesis 3, 15. Infant 
and weaned child have nothing to fear from cobra and viper. Okay, just think of the implications of those verses. Right. But the fossil record is loaded with examples of carnivorous activity. <laughs> yeah. All kinds of stuff. Many show that entire creatures were devoured by others, including a mammal that had eaten a dinosaur. And there's, there's a story in, in that, but the yeah. mammal eat, uh, ate a dinosaur. Uh, if all of this death occurred millions of years before Adam sinned, as all long age beliefs entail, then the Bible is wrong again. Right. And uh, we'll be back with more details shortly. Many people think that the biblical flood of Noah was abandoned because of the evidence. However, history tells a different story. Modern geological thought owes much to a man named Charles Lyell. Lyell, a lawyer, published a book in 1830 called Principles of Geology. Described as a masterpiece of persuasion, it changed the way people thought about Earth's past. According to Lyell, we should only appeal to today's geological processes to explain Earth history. However, this approach meant that the global flood recorded in the Bible was automatically ruled out of consideration. Lyell wanted, he wrote, to free the science of geology from Moses. Regrettably, many people have uncritically adopted Lyell's philosophy without considering how Noah's flood can help us understand Earth history. Lyell changed the way many people think, but his approach was motivated by his anti-biblical philosophy. Indeed, it is very difficult to explain Earth's history without Noah's flood. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. You just tuned in. We're talking about death before sin. What type uh, of death? Right. You know, um, many Christians have tried to add the concept of millions of years to the Bible, and uh, of course, the, the the newest proposal is uh, retroactive death, which is kind of the the inane idea that God right. precursed the world. That's the way we explain all the fossils and and things like that. Um, it's amazing what what some Christians have come up with. Right. Uh, unfortunately, many of these types of uh, you know, mental gymnastics that are tolerated in mainstream Christian community as theologically viable options to accommodate the millions of years, the, the, although the great age of the earth is a popular notion, it's non-biblical, right. and there's a truckload of scientific evidence against it. If you want to see some of that, go to creation.com slash age, and there you can see an article, 101 Evidences for Young Earth. So why don't all Christians just accept the biblical account of creation right. and a global flood to explain the majority of the fossil record? Why? Because science, and, and read here naturalism, <laughs> naturalism says the earth is millions of years old. That's the reason. Exactly. It's not biblical. The fact that none of these uh, options ever occurred to the church fathers and reformers and uh, only, you know, we only saw them in the church after the rise of yeah. uniformitarian There's geology and Darwinism makes it blatantly obvious that none of them were derived from the text of Scripture. Yes. These are efforts to accommodate Scripture to so-called science. And, and now we covered uh, this uh, in two previous episodes of Creation Magazine Live, Season 3, Episode 11, and Season 4, Episode 4. And uh, if you missed them, uh, here's a couple of links and you can just click on them and, and uh, watch these shows online. Now, these compromises don't work anyway. Uh, the only place to try to add long ages to the Bible is in the six days of creation. And there's, there's no way to add hundreds of thousands of years in the Genesis chronogenealogies, like in Genesis 5 and Genesis 11. And we're going to look at that issue next week on Creation Magazine Live. Now, Hugh Ross, who has deceived many Christians into thinking that it's okay to add millions of years into Genesis, has postulated that Adam and Eve may have been created around 60,000 years ago. Yeah, but people like Hugh Ross, like William Lane Craig and John Lennox, have overlooked a major flaw with their compromise. Their models uh, inevitably have humans uh, dying yeah. before the fall. And this is the result of accepting long age dating methods, uh, which date Homo sapien fossils to almost 200,000 years old. Yeah. This is way older than the biblical date for Adam. Even, even if we stretched out the, chrono, uh, the chronogenealogies there, way past the breaking point with massive gaps in Genesis 5 and 11, and, and we'll do more on that next week. But, but just one more thing. Some of these human fossils exhibit evidence of sinful actions such as murder and cannibalism. Right. So according to the naturalistic interpretations these Christians are using to propose deep time, it was death of fully human people before Adam sinned. Even right. setting aside the huge hurdles we've uh, discussed so far, and, and there are many more. For example, see uh, the book Refuting Compromise by Dr. Jonathan Sarfati. Great book. Th there's another aspect that seems rarely addressed by those willing to allow for the death of animals before Adam sinned. 
what kind of death would be occurring. Yes, yeah. Many seem to have the idea that before the fall, perhaps creatures lived out happy little lives and then simply went off <laughs> somewhere quiet to expire. But that isn't what the fossil-bearing rocks show. Yet there are real reasons why these respectability-craving theologians want millions of years in the first place. Uh, that, that's the reason they want them. The, the same fossil record shows that death of uh, death in, in the most hideous fashion occurred all over the world. Cancer, arthritis, tooth decay, bone infection, uh, vertebrae fusion, parasitic infections, abnormal teeth, uh, tumors, bite wounds, fractured bones. Uh, you see all kinds of that. Ossified tendons, acevacular necrosis, that's the, the death of bone due to lack of blood supply. Right. That, and that's just a sample of yeah. what's found in the fossil record. Animals did not go off and peaceably die, you know, die and, and that kind of thing. It wasn't a peaceful death at all. Kansas University dinosaur cancer researchers concluded, they said this, we statistically test this data for consistency with rates extrapolated from information on bone cancer in modern vertebrates and find that there is no evidence of a different rate. Right. So you've got uh, this record of death, cancer, all these things happening. Yep, it's all there. So what this means is that if the death of animals was occurring before the fall, and no matter what scheme you propose, gap theory, progressive creation, etc., there must have been death and agony of animals on Earth for billions and billions and billions of years. And this would, would all have to be categorized as very good according to God's Word because he ends work? the creation account saying, and everything was very good. At the end of creation. At the, At end, the of end of creation. day six, everything's there. All the animals are there, Adam and Eve and everything. And if you're going to stretch that out for uh, millions of years, you've got all this terrible stuff before Adam's in. Exactly. And we'll be right back. Genesis Verse by Verse is a Bible study tool available on CMI's website, designed to help pastors, students, and laymen alike study the book of Genesis like never before. And it's completely free. Simply look up any verse in Genesis 1 to 11 or just scroll down the page. The center column provides links to articles that answer common questions pertaining to that verse and the topics that naturally arise from them. Visit creation.com to use it today. So on this week's episode, we're talking about death before sin. Did animals die before Adam, uh, Adam sinned? And if so, what type of death were they experiencing? Right. One argument frequently brought up by old earth proponents to try to defend this animal death scenario is that Psalm 104, where, where it talks about lions seeking food from God in, in verse 21, it later mentions in verses 27 and 28 that it is the Lord that gives them their food and they are filled with, quote, good things. Right. Uh, this is used to show that predation is therefore good, but they're missing the point regarding the state of the initial creation entirely. Exactly. I mean, having a steak today, me, you know, sounds good, good to me, <laughs> but, uh, um, but really the thought that a cow had to have its head smashed in uh, just so I could have something to eat is probably something I'd rather not really dwell on, to be honest, yeah. um, because frankly, um, you know, the thoughts of it having its brain spill out all over the place just so I can eat a meal, it, it's quite revolting when you really think about wh where it comes from. Yeah. These verses uh, speak about the condition of the earth after the fall, not beforeing it. So eating a creature today might be seen as good in the sense it's better than a, a human going hungry, or, or sacrificing an animal for sin as, as per the Old Testament law. Right, um, right, yeah. You know, after the fall, because of its meaning, might, might be good but these were not needed in the original creation. That's right. Why would we be looking forward to a, a regenerated new heavens, a new earth, where a lion eats straw as an ox? Right. Uh, if lions were crunching through flesh and bones of creatures while they were, uh, the, the, while they were still alive, yeah. if that was considered good before. Right. Um, how many people can even watch a, a, a tabby cat slowly tear a mouse to pieces while it squeals in pain and call it very good? Right. I mean, even, even with little animals like that, it, it's, yeah. it's not good. I mean, we, we mentioned cancer earlier. Yes. And we, yeah. we pointed out that God would have had to call cancer very good if it's, the fossil record containing signs of cancer it's had there. already been laid down before Adam sinned. Yeah. So let's, let's look into this even more here. All cancers begin when one or more genes in a cell are mutated changed, right? Creating an abnormal protein or no protein at all. So the information provided by an abnormal protein is different from that of a uh, 
a, a normal protein, which can cause cells to multiply uncontrollably and become cancerous. That's right. where cancer comes from. Yeah. Creatures get cancer because DNA does not replicate perfectly and becomes abnormal. Right. So then cancer is a corruption of a good code. The fact that there are repair mechanisms in creatures to fix mutations indicates that God designed them to be able to replicate perfectly. Right. But every new generation of people begins life off with about 100 more mutations than their parents had. Our DNA is degenerating at an alarming rate. Now this makes perfect sense according to God's word that there was an initial perfect creation yep. a, a short while ago, not that long ago, then the flood occurred, right. and it has been suffering under a curse ever since, wearing out like a garment, as it says in Romans. That's right. So older proponents must face the fact that under their paradigm, uh, supposedly animals' DNA was already able to be corrupted from the time God created, uh, not due to a change in the fall. And so the fossil record then supposedly tells the tales uh, of, of creatures suffering from cancer and dying, not right. to not yeah. to feed another creature, you know, in a, in a circle of life type of, of thing, but simply because their genetic code was inherently flawed. Yeah. Uh, so the scenario, um, in, in this scenario, the, the the stench of death, the 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 horror of parasites, for example, bloodshed, cancer, and, and and suffering in the animal world, were all normal and good in God's sight. Yep. But can a Christian really say? Uh, the following, for example, when an animal gets cancer and dies, it's very good. Yeah, could you really say could, that? Could you really With say conviction, that? You know, um, we recognize these things as bad. I, um, why do we have such That's, an yeah, aversion yeah. To, to animal and human death? It's because death is an intrusion into this world. It's brought in by the sin because of the federal head of the human race, Adam, when he fell, um, that's where it comes from. What, what is the last enemy to be destroyed? Death. That's the biblical view. That's right. Have you ever stared at something and thought about how God created every single atomic particle in it from nothing and designed the mechanisms and forces by which the particles would bond together to form materials? The power and the intelligence of the Creator are astounding. This is the same God who created us to live on this planet and to enjoy and marvel at His creative power. All the answers to the key questions about our existence are laid out for us in the book of Genesis. When it happened, how it happened, what is our relationship with our Creator God, what is our role on this earth, and why we experience death and suffering in the midst of beauty. Because God Himself gave us His eyewitness account of what happened from the start of time, we have the one and only credible source for answering these fundamental questions, the Bible. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. So our subject today is death uh, before sin. What type of death? Death, yeah, not, not a very happy topic yeah. today, but, uh, <laughs> but important theologically, nonetheless. Yes. Now, most of us get the concept of life and death in terms of you know, cats and collies and canaries and, and creatures that we naturally have a certain degree of empathy for, right. but when we use the no death before sin argument, common questions that come up include, well, what do you mean by no death? Uh, you know, what, what if Adam stepped on an ant? Right. Uh, what about skin cells dying? You know, your skin gets old and it dies. Uh, don't plants die? There's another question. Uh, what about bacteria in Adam's digestive system that are used to, to, to digest his food? Weren't these organisms already dying before the fall? So what really is alive? I guess that's the question we need to ask. Right. How do you define life? And then we can draw a line between life and non-life. Uh, this is important since in order to adequately explain what is meant by the doctrine of no death before sin, we have to correctly define what constitutes life in the first place. So let's do that. Right. We want to do it biblically. Under the modern Western biological definition, any organism that can display movement, respiration, sensation, growth, reproduction, excretion, and nutrition, feeding, is considered to be living. However, this approach doesn't uh, match the biblical definition of life in the context we're discussing this week. And if the Bible defines life differently from modern biology, then arguments against the notion of no death uh, before the fall that presuppose the modern biological definition of life are invalid. Yeah, this is going to be off a bit there. Yeah. Uh, the, the biblical answer to the question of life and non-life is tied to the Hebrew word nefesh, mm -hmm. uh, meaning living being or living soul. We can therefore understand that if nefesh defines life, then only the nefesh creatures are subject to death as a result of the fall 
and they didn't die before then. Uh, the two area, the two main areas in Genesis where the word nephesh appears with particular frequencies are the creation of animals and man in Genesis 1 and 2, and the description of animals taken on board the ark in Genesis 6 and 7. Uh, you can see from uh, this chart here that some of the extensive usage of nephesh kaya in Genesis, this doesn't list every occurrence. This is just, just the main ones here that you're seeing. It, right, it just the main ones. In, in both places, the term is used in conjunction with defining specific groups of organisms. One deals with the impar, uh, importation or inclusion of this uh, life principle as the organisms are created, and the flood account is relevant because it was uh, God's intent to destroy all flesh. Where in the breath of life, uh, we read that in Genesis 6, 17, while uh, preserving representatives of all living land animals upon the ark. Right. So creatures that went on the ark are described as nephesh kaya, although it's only dealing, of course, with the land-dwelling, air-breathing ones, since the nephesh kaya creatures living in the sea were, were of course, able to survive the flood, right. most of them anyway. Uh, so these were uh, birds, cattle, and creeping things are listed there, likely reptiles and small vertebrates, and beasts. Uh, kind of a generic term. Land-dwelling creatures like, like insects, on the other hand, are probably not regarded as nephesh life. Right. There's, there's other passages that shed valuable light uh, on how we define life. Leviticus right. 17, yeah. 11 states, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Uh, the word translated life here is nephesh. This links life or spirit with the presence of blood. By blood, it's uh, likely that the common understanding of the term is intended. That is, the red liquid that is actively circulating right. uh, in the yeah. bodies of vertebrates. So yeah. Blood is an indicator of life in, in, in the nephesh sense, in the biblical sense here. And this logically connects in the way in which blood had to be shed for the forgiveness of sins. The right. life of the flesh is in the blood and so on. Sacrifices of this nature involved animals, specifically certain mammals and birds, while the flesh of the sacrificial animals was given for food, uh, a post-flood, uh, anyway, yeah. after meat-eating was allowed, the animal's life, its blood, was given for sacrifice. That's right. Uh, blood, or, sorry, death is the penalty for sin, so something had to die in order for, uh, to atone for people's sin. Right. Um, thus, blood had to be shed. So just um, before we get to some conclusions about uh, what it is or what it isn't uh, concerning nephesh life, um, I'd like to mention uh, a, a resource here that could really help people. Um, the book uh, by Dr. Jonathan Sarfati, Refuting Compromise. Yeah. Um, if you go to our web store at creation.com, uh, look up the book. When you're checking out, you can use the code CMLRC, uh, Creation Magazine Live, Refuting Compromise. And you can get 30% off uh, Jonathan's book. And uh, it's pretty well the premier biblical creation's defense uh, versus uh, you know, the, the positions where people have tried to use a biblical um, uh, I guess, reason to, to uh, promote long earth right. and, and yeah. these types of things. So really co uh, consider about purchasing that book because it will make a tremendous impact on your, your walk. Yeah. And we'll be back in one moment. Richard Van Grad and Kelvin Smith also host a fast-paced and informal internet-based video program called Genesis Unleashed. These faith-building teaching videos feature responses to news articles, summaries of articles on creation.com, interviews, and answers to some of the most asked questions about the creation evolution issue and the most attacked book of the Bible, Genesis. Visit creation.com's media center to view or subscribe to the latest video content. So our subject today is death before sin, what type of death? And, and just with the, uh, the information that we've looked at here, we can come to some conclu conclusions right. uh, of what is considered and what is not considered nephesh life. Uh, to start with, humans are clearly referred to as nephesh haya right from the start. Yes, yeah. And other vertebrates, including fish, are regarded as nephesh creatures. Uh, whales and large seagoing reptiles uh, are also included, included under the grouping of great sea creatures that you read about there in Genesis 1, 20 and 21. They'd be included there. Right. Land vertebrates, uh, um, including those now extinct uh, ones like dinosaurs, are, are covered under the classification of cattle, beasts, and creeping things. Birds no. are also included. If not referenced uh, directly as Nephesh in Genesis 1, they're certainly included amongst those living creatures brought before Adam, Genesis 2.19, and also in the flood account uh, among those brought on board the ark. Right. See some of the details there. Yep. Uh, again, insects and other invertebrates are likely not regarded as nephesh creatures, while the group translated as creeping things in Genesis 1.24 that you see there uh, are, are regarded as nephesh. 
this is referring to uh, a small invertebrates perhaps, lizards, frogs, right. mice, those types of things. Now this term is not used to refer to insects or other invertebrates. The account of Noah adds support for that. Uh, the creatures taken on board the ark did not include invertebrates. Uh, although creeping things are included in the description of all flesh that perished in the flood, this is then further qualified as being all those in whose nostrils was the breath of life. It says that in Genesis 7, 21 and 22. Right, so what about plants, right? The, the term uh, nefesh haya is right. never applied to describe plants. Furthermore, plants don't have blood, which is intrinsically linked, as we've seen, to, to nefesh life. Nefesh, yeah. um, so this is uh, evident in the account of Cain and Abel, where Cain's sacrifice of plants was not acceptable to God, for there was no blood. Unlike Abel's sacrifice, um, you know, it had animals for, for food, obviously. So sure. single-celled organisms such as bacteria and individual cells within an organism, they're not regarded as nephesh life uh, uh, either. Right. A clear understanding of the Bible's definition of what life is and what is considered to be truly alive helps us tackle the, the, the skeptics' questions leveled at us regarding the Scripture's reliability in areas of life, death, and the fall. Uh, for example, as with many as, as, as with, with, with any subjects, in many subjects, we should start with what the Bible has to say and build our understanding from there. Uh, that's, that's what we do on, on this program as, as much as we can. Uh, that's what we do with Creation Magazine, um, Creation Magazine Live, Creation Magazine. Th th that magazine has changed the lives of thousands and thousands of people over, uh, we're approaching 40 years, 37, 38 years mm -hmm. or something like that with the magazine going out to over 100 countries all around the world is a fantastic faith-building magazine. It had, a, I know, a big impact on my life. Right. Growing up, I had a lot of questions like this. What about death before the fall? And, well, and Adam and Eve were commanded to eat plants, so certainly plants were dying, weren't, weren't they? And, and, you See, know. I, I think one of the, the biggest things that happens with many Christians is they're not starting their uh, thinking about these questions from the point of view of the Bible. A skeptic will throw something at them. That's a part and, of it, and, yeah. And, and what they'll do is they go, oh, yeah, well, yeah, but plants are, are, are alive and stuff like that. And they're not centering their, their whole argument based on Scripture. So then you can be taken off course. And then what we find, right, is many Christians using the same arguments that atheists use against the Bible. Christians are, are, are buying into that and, oh, we've got to adopt millions of years or, or evolution and things like that. Yeah, but they've actually yeah. been, in a sense, tricked into arguing against you know, a plain reading of God's Word. And, and another issue seems to be biblical, uh, biblical knowledge, just plain biblical literacy. Right, what does the Bible um, even a say? A lot of folks just don't have an understanding of what the Bible says. So right. um, uh, we teach that in Creation Magazine as well. You can get a free copy at creation.com slash free mag. Next week on Creation Magazine Live, how old is the earth? Very controversial. See you next week. <laughs>